Imagine your house growing food. I don't mean in a pot inside the house. I mean growing food on the outside of your house, on the roof, on the walls. I've spent way too much time making this idea come true. I believe that our buildings, homes, industrial buildings, shopping centers, office towers can easily grow food. Everything is readily accessible for plants. Nutrients, water, soil, sun. Soil's pretty much the only thing that's missing here. But if you look at all our homes in Australia are built on what was prime farmland or natural habitat, soils that supported life. I designed buildings to take a load of soil and put it on top instead of digging it up and sending it away. It's precious stuff. I think we need to cherish it. One of the most amazing things about soil is that you can grow food, but you can also, it's also full of life. And once you've got it on the roof of your building, there's usually people that inhabit buildings. And when they inhabit buildings, they create grey water. And that's where water comes in. The average Australian family produces almost 100,000 litres of grey water every year. That's enough to grow 60 tonnes of potatoes and 40 tonnes of tomatoes. That's every single family in this, in this country. Sun, well, that's easy. Every single building in Australia is virtually soaked in the stuff. Nutrients. A third of the world's gas today gets used for making fertilizer for growing plants, mainly for growing food. How's this for an idea? Why not take the piss? Urine is sterile, it's loaded with nutrient, <laughs> nutrients, and um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, trace elements. So I wanted to show how easy urine harvesting was. Last year at Melbourne's Food and Wine Festival, I set up the toilets to be able to harvest urine. We harvested 3,000 litres in three weeks. <laughs> and we had one customer going to the McDonald's toilet across the road because couldn't deal with the fact that we were somehow... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we did, and that's... Um, I mean, it's, I think it's quite amazing that we've got seven billion people today creating fertiliser and we just waste the stuff. This Perth greenhouse, we built this in 2009. It's surrounded by conventional building materials, concrete, glass, steel, brick and tiles. This is adding to what is becoming a major problem. These materials soak up the sun and basically generate heat, and that becomes a heat island effect, which is a major problem in cities all across the world. What about if we, um, what about if we change the materials? I'm working with a group of scientists from the CSIRO who are collecting data from the buildings that are built. And one of them said something to me a few weeks ago that just blew my mind. He said that Victorian electricity utilities are spending $2 billion upgrading their capacity just for 20 hours per year. $2 billion. Now, why don't we grow plants? Spend $2 billion on covering our cities with plants, cool them naturally, and they soak up pollution at the same time. How did I get so excited about plants? This guy, my dad, is responsible for a lot of it. He was obsessed with growing food and, you know, loved his plants and it caught on. And when I was nine, we migrated to Australia, to a place in, uh, in the Yarra Valley, or very Monbog, very close to Sherbrooke Forest. I just could not believe how big the trees were and how many amazing exotic species of plants there were. That sort of got me going, and it eventually led to a life of dealing with plants or working with plants. And I started doing flowers, and you know, when I was 19, 20, I started doing flowers for, uh, and, and installations using plants and flowers in uh, Melbourne's restaurants and bars. And as my confidence grew, so did the scale of the work. It started as small displays, but I always wanted to, to highlight you know, the particular special bits of the plants that people might perceive, like here, the bulbs are as beautiful as the flowers. Um, this dinner that I did for Penfolds is at the top of um, the Rialto Tower, and it was a demolition site, uh, which is now Vieux de Monde. And um, I decided to grow the table, <laughs> bringing a new meaning to the term grazing. <laughs> this was a great dinner. This installation I called dry was in 2004. We, we were, had a pretty bad drought in uh, Victoria, and these trees had died because of drought willow trees off our land. And I decided to insert them into bathtubs just to make people think that 
yeah, there's more to, that simply water restrictions are not the only thing that you need to deal with when you've got drought. There's, uh, you know, there's a lot of other implications to it. In 2000, Jenny and I bought some, my wife Jenny and I, who's here somewhere, bought some land, and we decided to build a house out of straw and other easily recyclable materials and non-toxic materials. In 2008, Rob Adams from the city of Melbourne said, why don't you build a prototype of your house at Federation Square? And in 2008, we did, and we decided to mix hospitality into, rather than just a boring old display home and then going somewhere else for a drink, I thought, well, why don't we incorporate all the sustainable ideas? And that's when the greenhouse was born. The rooftop garden, I'm quite proud of that, the fact that we harvested 45 kilos of potatoes from one square meter bin. And again, this is the heat island effect. The place was so hot, I was just surrounded by concrete tiles and glass. And just mix that with water and everything just grew. I even picked cucumbers on Flinders Street. <laughs> I didn't plant the bloody things, I don't know how they got there. <laughs> Soil on roofs and vertical gardens um, have lots of benefits. They insulate, they stop stormwater runoff, they sur uh, cool the surrounding environment, create habitat for insects, birds, bees, wildlife. One of the most amazing benefits I found out early, early last year in 2012 when the CSIRO decided to do a bushfire test or simulate a bushfire on a house that we built on their test site. This is a straw bale house with a, an amazing Chinese imported cladding, soil on the roof, and I'll just show you what happened. It's a 45-minute test condensed into 20 seconds. But yeah, it was pretty, um, it was the longest 45 minutes of my life. It's a thousand degrees. We got up to for about three minutes. A straw bale house, how's that? But the scientists credited the soil roof design with it being the first house that they've ever tested that humans would have survived in. It went from 24 to 30 degrees. That was the maximum it got to, 30 degrees. And that happened about 20 minutes after the fire had stopped. And the, the particles per million inside were well within what you would have, you know, you would have got sore eyes, but I'm quite proud of the fact that they classified as a bunker. This is Aki, the daughter of Mitch Watson, whose house I've just built in Dalesford, Victoria. We've just finished it. There's still a few little bits and pieces to be done, he'll probably say, but... <laughs> <laughs> is she in a park? No, she's not in a park. She's on the roof of her house. <laughs> That's actually, we dropped her in, but yeah. This house has created habitat. It hasn't taken it away which that's what I'm trying to do here. Why do we build houses, or why do we build buildings just for humans? We forget about every, all the other living, living creatures, whether it's microbes in the soil, or animals and insects in the whole cycle. We can easily create places that are, that are habit, habitat for all living creatures, and make better places to live. This is the next project that is happening this year. It's called Farm by Yoast, and it's happening on the rooftops of the disused Melbourne office tower. It's got a thousand square meter glass house, which we'll use for growing food, but we'll also be uh, farming fish. There's an incorporated restaurant, which is made from straw, and it's actually going to be powered by, bur by burning straw and turning it into charcoal using pyrolysis, or biochar, and the biochar will be used to enrich the soils. We will also have, um, this will be completely zero waste venue, just like Silo in Melbourne. All our, um, basically everything we do will not generate any waste. I mean, I want to deal with all of human waste, but the health department might not agree with me with that. <laughs> this amazing machine is in the foyer, so please check it out. You guys are probably all desperate to go and have something to eat, but this machine is called a dehydrator. And it turns all our waste into 10% of its original volume overnight and makes it safe, sterilizes it, and takes all the moisture out. 
And we've been using it to grow things like potatoes and um, um, be uh, beetroot and carrots and rhubarb. This is the reason why we can be waste free. The, we will also catch carp, Australia's most invasive pest. Nine out of every 10 kilos of fish in Australian rivers today are carp. We will catch and purge uh, the carp in tanks on the roof and then serve it to create incredible dishes. This is some of the ideas behind being waste free. Our dairy farmers produce milk, amazing milk, and they simply deliver it to us in stainless steel 20 litre kegs. So everything from our mineral water to wine to beer to whiskey comes in gin, comes in returnable. Gin's my favourite, so. <laughs> and it's made locally, how good's that? Comes in these returnable crates. So everything about this place is designed with, at, with the end in mind, zero waste. I want to leave with this image because it's one of my favourite images. There was life there for three months in Federation Square where the gardens were thriving and we had birds and bees and I had beehives and it just, I think, for me, I made, it realize, I made people realise that you can have biodiversity in the heart of our cities. We need to maybe just change the way we think about our housing and our communities and think about all the other living creatures in the world. The most amazing thing about this idea is that we can easily grow enough food I believe we can easily grow enough food just where we live. And that means that we may end up being able to replant all the lost forests and start creating habitat again for nature instead of just keeping and cutting it and, and trashing it as we're doing now. So I think it's all up to you guys. Let's start using our, our homes to start growing food. Thank you.